This is a very pure concentrate of rare earths. It contains around 95% of concentration of rare earths. And in this bag, there's around 5 to 6% of this prosium and terbium. These are two of the 17 metallic elements that make up what are known as rare earth elements. Dysprosium and terbium are heavy rare earths used to create magnets in electric vehicles. We went to Goiania, Brazil to see one step in the long process of turning clay into some of the most valuable material on the planet but most of us already interact with rare earth elements every day. As the world becomes more uh, electrical, we're going to be converting a lot of electricity into movement. No? We're seeing that in, el in electric vehicles, we see that in wind turbines. We're going to see that a lot in robotics. So we care about the rare earths that go into the permanent magnets. Ramon Barua Costa is the CEO of Aclara Resources, a mining company based in Chile. This is the company's pilot plant in Brazil. Help me understand scales. Compare what you're producing here to what you would need to produce going yes. forward. How far from that are you? It is very small. It is very small. We can process several tons of clays here, but out of one ton, we extract around 100 grams. No? So it's around 0.1% of production. So for demonstration purposes, it works very, very well. It will provide, this pilot plant also will provide the material that we need in order to prove our separation facility. Aclara gets mineral deposits that it processes, but what it can process is a drop in the bucket. China has an advantage because they have a type of deposit that is called uh, an ionic clay, and they use it to extract these, these elements. They are so important and so scarce that China uh, has been restricted precisely these elements. Brazil comes in a distant second behind China in deposits, but deposits are just one part of the story. Another more expensive part is processing the raw materials, and that's where China really calls the shots. We do know that they discovered uh, the ironic clay deposits in the 1970s, so they have been mining these elements for 50 years now. We know that they are also extracting uh, rivers from Myanmar, and we know that in the case of heavy rivers, the quota of production in China has been very stable for the last 15 years. In rivers in general, they control around 60% of the market. In the case of heavy rivers, it's probably very close to 100% of the market. China has also used its dominance in the rare earth supply chain to further its geopolitical ambitions, a tactic that Laura Taylor Kale saw firsthand as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Industrial Base Policy under President Biden. It's China that dominates in mining. When we take a look at processing of rare earth elements, it's also China, Malaysia, of Japan that account for 100% of the processing, with China completely dominating that, that process. Taylor Kale was responsible for setting America's rare earth strategy in the Biden administration. She remembers when the U.S. was holding the strongest hand. It was a time when the United States was the dominant producer of rare earth elements and processing, and over the years that has changed significantly. Uh, we are now um, importing 95% 95% of our rare earths from China, um, including the ones that for a while, even including the ones that we use in major defense systems. So it's a very real vulnerability and a very real vulnerability when we know and have seen um, a recent and over the years China's willingness to use um, their dominance of rare earths, uh, mining and processing to, um, um, to, to manipulate markets and to stymie uh, competitors, global competitors. For the past 15 years, China has used its dominance in rare earths to get more favorable terms in trade deals. We need to continue this kind of minerals diplomacy as well as take it into account in these economic and trade negotiations. Again, you can play hardball with Canada and with Japan and with other countries, South Africa, DRC, but we also, they also have things that we need, um, including these rare earth elements, whether it's in the raw form and mining or also in potential processing capacity and industrial capacity. American policymakers also know that diplomacy alone isn't enough. Over the past five years, the U.S. has allocated hundreds of millions of dollars to rare earth processing plants and magnet factories, with President Trump picking up the baton from the Biden administration. 
I will also take historic action to dramatically expand production of critical minerals and rare earths here in the USA. The United States hasn't completely uh, been out of the game and hasn't completely been blind to this. Uh, we also have within, I'll just speak within defense in particular, because I think it's an important national security case. Within defense, we have taken over the years the notion of looking at our defense in terms of short-term um, uh, priorities, particularly under the Biden administration, according to the National Defense Industrial Strategy that I helped um, launch and author uh, out of the Defense Department. We made a concerted push for a mind to magnet um, uh, uh, strategy for rare earth elements in particular, understanding that the, you know, the F-35 magnets are a particular vulnerability as well as other key systems like the Virginia class submarines and the Columbia class submarines. We made investments in MP materials through the Defense Logistics Agency, which administers the national defense stockpile through the Defense Production Act Title III, as well as through the Industrial Base Fund. All of these things are, are in existence now. And because of the investments that we made over the last four years, and in particular, uh, showing Congress that we could effectively use the authorities that we have as long as we had appropriations, I think we've gotten to a point where this administration can really run, um, run fast. But Taylor Kale admits that today, it's become a game of catch up for the US. I think from our standpoint, mining and processing of a rare earths is messy, it's expensive, there's a lot of um, environmental issues that come up as a result. Sometimes it's a lot easier to import these things rather than to produce them domestically. We also don't have the workforce uh, that can really support uh, the processing uh, and mining of rare earth elements and other critical, critical minerals. China dominates in that sense as well. Back in Brazil, Aclaras Barua knows just how expensive and time consuming it is to get a foothold in the rare earth supply chain. I think the work that we have been able to accomplish uh, will allow us to have a marginal cost of production that is competitive with China. Uh, we have created a system called the, the circular mineral harvesting that we, where we do not use explosives. There's no crushing and no milling, which are the two stages that consume most of the energy in the industry. We need to make the investment. And that cost of capital is adding to our cost of production. And that's where we lose competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis China. So the name of the game right now is try to secure the lowest cost of capital possible. Governments play a, a fantastic role there. There are grants available. We've seen them deployed uh, uh, in several other companies. Uh, low cost loans will also help uh, achieve that. And we at Aclara, we are prepared to uh, uh, pass through that lower cost of capital into our customers in order to become a, a, a producing asset. Brazil is doing its part to attract miners like Aclara to its mineral reserves. Essa questão dos minerais estratégicos, eles são tratados realmente com muita atenção, muito cuidado e muita estratégia por nós. Então, tudo que está acontecendo agora, esse contexto, nós já é, entendíamos né, que de fato é uma ação extremamente pontual e importante para o Brasil e para o mundo, pelo potencial que o país tem. Inácio Melo é o presidente do Brasil Geological Service, que é parte do seu Ministério de Mining. Quando se fala né, de, de mudança, né, se pensa em minerais, minerais estratégicos. E essa estratégia, nós já tínhamos, antes de todo esse, né, esse contexto que se tem hoje, é, isso né, por conta do cuidado e do trabalho do presidente Lula, do ministro Alexandre, Alexandre Silveira, em parceria conosco. One of the agency's main functions is to map out the country's mineral resources, a critical first step in catching up with China. Even there, the odds are long. Em torno de 30% do país está mapeado, ou seja, ainda nós entendemos que ainda não é uma quantidade grande, mas que com esse contrato que assinamos, com essa tecnologia extremamente avançada, que é a tecnologia é que foi é, prospectada nos grandes players mundiais, como Austrália, Estados Unidos, Alemanha, 
Canadá com esta tecnologia. A nossa intenção é atrair investimentos seguros, né, sustentáveis, para que nós possamos avançar com terras raras e outros é, é, minérios que, que fazem parte de todo esse contexto. The reception that we have had in Brazil has been incredibly good, both from the federal government and from the local government of the state of Goiás. I think something that should not be taken for granted is that Brazil has a vision in terms of the role that they want to play in the future. And that is, a, I, I would say, I would call it a country vision. Everybody shares this. And, and so when you present them with a project like this, every, everyone wants to help. That need for a non-China rare earth supply chain is so great that among countries and companies, a competitive industry has morphed into a forced collaboration. Very recently, uh, I saw an article that there were 40 rare earth companies already in Brazil. But again, we don't feel that they are a direct competition of ours, no? We, we care only about those who can produce heavy rare earths uh, uh, effectively. How we are differentiating ourselves, I think we, we, we have two main uh, factors that make Aclara very different. We want to do it all, no? That opens strategic opportunities, commercial opportunities that other uh, uh, miners don't necessarily have. And the other thing that I believe is a very strong uh, advantage of, of, of the Aclara proposition is our shareholders, no? Right now, the Hochschild Group owns 57% of Aclara and the CAP Group owns 10% of Aclara. If I start with the Hochschild Group, this is a group that has more than 100 years operating in, 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 in Latin America, doing mining, doing industry, doing innovation, and becoming suppliers, you know, of very sophisticated industries all around the world. So it's in our DNA to be long-term suppliers. And again, I think that what this industry is looking for is not molecules. No, they're not looking for neodymium, praseodymium, dysprosium, or terbium. They're looking for permanent magnets, no? So they need, and the key word right now, even much more than price, is reliability. Brazil is betting that it can offer that reliability to the world. Barua thinks Brazil has what could be a winning hand. It just has to play its cards right.